Welcome to the second episode of the Lighthouse Podcast. I'm your host, Kenford Batana, and today's guest is Dr. Jack Cruz, neurosurgeon extraordinaire, the menace to big pharma and centralized medicine, and the leader of decentralized medicine, a paradigm that is able to resolve chronic health epidemics that we face globally today. His information has changed the lives of my friends and my family. And the least I can do to give back, to pay it forward, is to join the group of people that have shared his information online and further immortalized it so that someone out there who struggled with a chronic health condition that has been to every centralized doctor to no avail, they happen to come across one of these podcasts and they gain an insight. They find a gem and the trajectory of their life changes. That is the universal purpose that all of us in the quantum biology community share. And it's an honor to be a part of that. So without further ado, let's get right into the episode. Could you give us a little background about yourself, specifically your credentials and how you grew up with this apparent intellectual sharpness? Well, this, the, the people that tell me I'm intellectually sharp, I kind of chuckle because mm -hmm. I'm a big uh, believer in decentralization, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, I became uh, pretty sharp because of centralization, because of the museums in New York City when I grew up as a poor white kid in that community. And I, back in the 60s and 70s, I was able to tag along to rich kids who were being taught by the, you know, the ladies in those museums all these different stories about different parts of science. It, it didn't include just biology. It included Archaeology included astrology, uh, evolution, evolutionary biology, biology, chemistry, physics, uh, even cosmology, astrobiology, and the eight planetarium. So I was immersed in a soup that allowed me to imbibe many, many, many different things. And I was fortunate to be born probably in my family, the way I was. I was born after my mother went through a miscarriage. She went through a miscarriage mm -hmm. because of decisions that she made actually around light. And she actually was Catholic. She prayed to one of the saints in Catholicism called St. Jude. She said, if you give me a healthy child, not allow me to miscarriage, I promise... You know, I'll do all I can to do the things I can. And the funny thing about my mom, obviously she didn't know anything about quantum biology. But what did she do when she was pregnant with me? Um, she had a can of salmon every day. She went to Central Park. She never wore sunglasses. She took them off. And she would sit there and watch the pigeons right around what would become Waldenburg Park. Why? Because I... My family is from New York City. We lived there for a long time. My grandfather was a New York City um, policeman. And that was true from the 1920s all the way through the 1960s and 1970s. And I was born at that time. So when I came into the world, I was dropped into what I think was a pretty good situation. Uh, where centralization really was not harmful. I, and I don't want to say it wasn't harmful. It was, but not as harmful as it was to the degree it is today. And I was dropped into a situation where when I was born, uh, I was very loved because of what my mom and dad had gone through, you know, with the last pregnancy. And... I happened to come out of my mother, a very different kid. My mom, <laughs> my mom's dead now, obviously, but she used to tell me stories that when I was two and three years old, how I would flummox 
you know, people in my family and teachers and things like that because I was so curious and my family was actually really good to me. They, they bought me things that would stimulate my intellect. So my parents are very early on bought me the World Book of Encyclopedias. I had it almost completely memorized by the time I was four years old. Uh, my godmother, who her name was Bonnie Legion, um, she actually died of a glioblastoma when I was in residence. She was 38 years old. She bought me a chemistry set when I was six years old. She told my mother at Christmas, she goes, I know that I probably shouldn't buy Jack this. Uh, but she goes, there's something that tells me that he's going to be stimulated by this. And turns out my, my godmother, she was, she was, I don't want to say a prophet, but she was pressing that she knew there was something different about me. Uh, than most other kids and what the difference is between me and anybody else showing me uh, and I, and I this this may sound bragging to a lot of people but it's not when you can back it up I am the most curious person you will ever meet you pose a question to me or if the world pose a question to me I will not stop until I figure it out Sometimes it'll take me years to figure it out. Like the story you know, that I relayed to Rick and to Huberman on Rick's podcast on Tetragrammaton. That was a long process. Um, it's not something that I came to quickly. Uh, the pieces were there. When it happened, the Eureka moment, it seemed fast. Like when I talked about it on that podcast. But I promise you that the 40 years before that, every single one of those years were really, really important in order to figure that out. Um, and it's not something that's lost on me. It really isn't. And I have this fundamental belief that one of the things that we've lost in, mo in the modern world, because the modern world now is sculpted by light that's not from our sun, it's actually alien light, is that we've lost a little bit of I don't think the younger generation really is that curious anymore. I think they accept a lot of things, you know, that they hear on TikTok, a lot of the things they hear on Instagram, a lot of things they hear on Twitter. They're they're all about the short little message, you know, teach me quantum biology, Uncle Jack, and a couple of tweets, and let's get out of here. That's actually been my existence for the last 20 years on social media. And I have to tell you, I chuckle at that, but at the same time, it's actually done some good for me. Why? Because it's actually allowed me to hone my skills to get the message out. Um, like if you go and look at my Twitter feed, for example, this morning, I decided to post something because of a consult that I did. Um, that's tangentially related to the Uberman podcast about the carnivore diet and, you know, muscles. And I said, you know, I told my nurse when we were here in El Salvador, I said, I'm going to post something this morning that's going to really rock people's world. Um, I'm going to do seven or eight tweets and explain to people some of the most complex science. And I have to tell you, 20 years ago, I don't think I was capable of doing that, Kenford, uh, if it wasn't probably for your generation. Your generation mm -hmm. has forced me to reduce the word salad and give you the truth unabashed. And what has that done? I think for the older crowd, it's pissed them off. You know, the boomers seem, look, I don't understand all these words. I don't do this and that. They're not good with Google Translate or, or searching things, and they get pissed off at me because of that. But at the same time, I tell them the same thing I would tell you, that uh, if you're interested in, in the things and the concepts that I talk about, take your time and do what you did in third grade. Go to the library, copy the things down, write them, you know, re rewind it. Like, I didn't have this ability to rewind things that I heard 
in the Museum of Natural History about like the Archaeopteryx or what I learned about blue giants and red giants. But I have to tell you, I have a photographic memory. I, I, my memory is spectacular. It's always been good. And I don't forget things that matter to me. The things that I do forget are the things that I view as superfluous. And I've been fortunate because of my teachers, um, the people have impacted me. I didn't have in my young life a lot of bullshit put in my head. I actually had a lot of people tell me the truth. The, the people that pulled bullshit in my head probably were the religious instruction stuff that I went through because of my mom uh, early on because she was very devout Catholic. And I would say probably the a lot of the other stuff that was what I call scientism or religious was the science that I learned about centralized medicine through dental school, medical school, and residency. And in those 18 months that you heard me wax poetic about in the Uberman podcast, that it was very, very difficult for me to subtract that stuff. Why? Because that is like, was the backbone I felt of my knowledge. And when the backbone of your knowledge is shown to, to have some big holes in it, you have really three choices to make. The first choice is to ignore it. The second choice is to bullshit your way around it. And I think the third choice is actually to examine it with your educated mind and then come up and find out why it was wrong and then come up with a new idea of what may fill in the blanks for what was the previous paradigm. And to me, the third option was always the best option because I felt that's what happened with Newton. It's what happened with Einstein. It's what happened with Da Vinci. It's what happened with Michelangelo. It's what happened with uh, Jonas Salk. It's actually what happened, you know, with his nemesis, uh, uh, Sabin, who came up with the opposite vaccine. It's also what happened with the people that were involved in the Solvay Conference in 1927, you know, when quantum mechanics was being formulated and they fought it out between Einstein, Bohr, Rosen, Heisenberg, uh, even Madame Curie was at, you know, that meeting. She died soon after, but did she play a role? She did. Did Louis de Broglie play a role? He played a role. And all these little things were in, I would like to tell you, the soup of my mind. Um, the soup of my mind 20 years ago, when, you know, I faced my own dilemma, my own, my own demons of why my own life was a problem from not only my own personal medical problems, but from the job that I was doing, the things that I loved to do, because I always knew that I was, I was really gifted to be a doctor. I, I was also gifted to be a professional athlete, but I turned that down mainly because of my mother. And, you know, my nurse to this day, Chantal, always gets mad at me when I say this. But the biggest regret that I truly have is that I didn't choose the option of being a professional athlete because I think it would have been <laughs> the easier choice. I wouldn't have been controversial. I would have made a ton more money. Uh, it probably would have been easier. But looking, looking at it now at 60 years old, I don't know if I would have been as passionate because I can tell you at 60 years old right now, as an old man, I'm pretty passionate about what I do. I'm pretty passionate about getting to the truth. And I know that the truth is not axiomatic. It's, a, it's an approximation the best data that we have now. The problem is the best data that we have now is not what's found in centralized medicine. It's actually found in decentralized medicine. And I think that the public has just woken up even to this issue uh, in the last three years because of what we've all faced through COVID. I think 
even the most ardent critic uh, of my work would agree, you know, the line that I drew in the sand three years ago when I decided to go and do a documentary with Dr. McCullough um, and some of the other leaders um, that are out there to speak out against this. Um, you put a you put a target on your back. You put a professional target on your back that people can shoot, that they can cancel you. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say that I wear it as a badge of honor. I felt that was my duty. You know, Dr. Malone, who was also in the same video, I think the thing that all three of us, I've never talked to either one of them about this, but I think the thing that all three of us are still pissed off about is that that movie, that documentary, had it behind a paywall. It had to be hidden, because if it wasn't, we would have been canceled. Now, here we are in 2023, you know, on the second half of the year, and you see the things that are breaking in the UK. You see the things that are breaking in Australia. You see the things that are now breaking in Australia, where, I should say in Canada, where people are talking about the complications of the vaccine. And people are beginning to wake up that some of us, you know, were soothsayers telling you the truth in the beginning. It wasn't that we're looking for attribution or uh, being lauded. We're trying to explain something deep to the public. That centralized science has a, a very big train in it. And it's not based on the truth. It's based on profiteers of the people that control it. And when you devoid or let's say opt out for the experts in the centralized paradigm, you're giving a lot away, a lot. And you have to understand that that's a trade that you're making. I understand there's going to be a lot of people that listen to your podcast that say, well, Jack, we just didn't know, you know, two, three, four years ago. Well, you actually did because me, McCullough, and Malone were telling you, even on Twitter, Go back and fact check the Twitter and look at it. We're telling you that none of us, absolutely no, all three of us, none of us were anti-vax. RFK Jr. is running for president of the United States, same thing. He's not anti-vax, but he was anti this vax for a very specific reason. Uh, because we didn't get the answers that we really needed from the centralized profiteers. And now we're finding out that all of our so-called conspiracy theories from mainstream media, you know, from state medical boards, from professional guilds, from the critics, you know, guys like you, Kenford, that were on Twitter that thought we were wackadoos, that we, that we were crazy, um, that we didn't know what we were talking about. Uh, now you kind of know it's true. Why is this a good thing? Why, why do I say this failure for where we are now is a good thing because it's got everybody's attention. Now they realize they got punched in the mouth by Mike Tyson. And they're like, what else are we being lied about? What, what are the main drivers of Neolithic disease and centralized medicine that centralized physicians are impotent to fix? Um, and it turns out what we're good, let's start out what we're good at. We're good at Acute medical conditions. You get a subdural hematoma, you're great at that. You break your leg, you break your arm, you fracture your neck. Uh, you know, you get a small bowel obstruction. Uh, we're really good at treating those things. You, you, I would tell everybody in the world listening to this podcast, do not doubt the care that you're being given in the acute medical, you know, emergency setting. Where you need to be a very informed consumer is when you have obesity, diabetes, hypothyroidism, autism, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, frontal temporal dysplasia, heart disease. Um, those are just a few off the top of my head. I, I probably put in autoimmunity just so we can cover the people in Europe, Australia, and, and uh, Canada. You begin to see a different viewpoint. That's where centralized medicine fails. 
And you have to decide as the public how long or how much rope you're going to give us before you begin to question the narrative. And I think right now, post-COVID, everybody's pretty much fed up. Whether, no matter what your ideology is, whether you're right, left, or independent in any country globally, I think everybody now knows the aftermarket data is pretty crystal clear that centralized medicine led by Dr. Fauci, who pretty much misled the world, not only the people in the United States and the politicians in the United States, but also misled the world with the help of the people at the IMF, the World Health Organization, really fueled by the people at the World Economic Forum. Um, these are the people that are your enemy. And your goal, if you choose to accept it, is to realize that you need to embrace decentralization in your life. You need to understand what that means first and foremost. And you need to understand that you, your opinion of what's in your head, is just as good as the experts. If you don't believe me, the biggest medical errors in the 20th and 21st century have been made by centralized experts. Okay? That, that includes both politics, medicine, uh, and economics. There, there is absolutely no way to argue that point differently. But ultimately, it's up to you, because you're the CEO of you when it comes to the biology of you, to decide what you want to do from this point forward. And that's right. kind of right. where, where I would say a person listening to this podcast needs to start. I can experientially confirm that my generation is not curious they don't dive into anything. They kind of just listen to what the norm, normal consensus is, the normal notion is, and it's not, doesn't get past that. So when a guy like but me, you, who, but, who's, all, you're, but your, your, your generation needs to understand this, Kendra, mm -hmm. that consensus positions is inherently pseudoscientific. There is I no agree. consensus in science, scientific method. In fact, none at all. Um, and I can wax poetic on that for a multitude of time. I'm not going to do that with you, but I want that statement out there in this podcast for people to know when everybody tells you there is consensus in science, that is a huge red flag that it's centralized and it's pseudoscientific. Right. So one of the problems I feel like with the notion of well, first issue, all of these people are surrounded by blue light right off the bat. It kind of caps your ability to see the truth right in front of your face, as you said in the 2017 Vermont talk, right? And also another thing is the notion of light being a main driver of your biology is so far removed from current notions is no one even bats an eye to it. It sounds ridiculous, crazy, etc. to people like us. Uh, and so one thing I want to unpack is, could you set the context for why light isn't just a harmless visual optical medium that is separate from your biology? It's just out there, your biology is in here. That's that's a faulty notion. In fact, light is a main driver of your biology through light, water, magnetism, the three-legged stool. Could you unpack how physics drives biology? Yeah, I would tell you that there's this is a multi-pronged mm -hmm. argument. The first prong that I would give you, I think it's the prong, prong that's the least inarguable for even the critics, is that all food webs on planet Earth relate back to photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is derived from the sun. Most people learn in third grade that it's sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water form sugar. Nobody argues with that. But the problem is when you flip the switch and then look at the people that tell you it's all about diet and exercise, uh, they fail to realize that diets, all diets, fundamentally link back to light. And then they forget to realize that Many of the things that are in your local supermarket 
are not grown under photosynthetic qualitative analysis programs. They're, they're grown in a lab somewhere by ConAgra or Nestle, and they're Franken foods. And they're Franken foods. What does this mean? It means fundamentally that the deuterium to H plus content is fundamentally flawed. And that opens up a huge can of worms about what that means for the black swan mitochondria. It means that you have to understand about how the TCA cycle and the urea cycle works. That was actually tied to the Twitter you know, storm that I put out today on, what is it, today's August 7th or 8th. It, it ties directly <laughs> to that. And I would tell you that uh, that's the first prong. The second prong is the prong you brought up. Um, we were optimized uh, for 3.8 billion years of evolutionary history through the first two domains of life, right? Bacteria and archaea. We came on to the scene, and when I say we, I want to be very clear here. We meaning eukaryotes. 650 million years ago, when the third domain of life showed up on this planet, that domain of life forms all complex life. All 32 phyla of complex life come from eukaryotes. None, no complex life comes from bacteria or archaea. But the most interesting part of the eukaryote story is that we hijacked a bacteria slash archaea to become a mitochondria. And a mitochondria is a big part of that eukaryote story. So what does that mean? It means that you fundamentally have to understand what the thermodynamics of that stowaway package is, what we did to it, why it happened, and when you parse it down, you'll find out that it fundamentally was tied to the light change in the environment that occurred at that time. So here we are, part one of the story, we talked about photosynthesis being a light story. Now, here we are explaining the third kingdom of light that we come from is also a light story. Well, guess what? We're two for two here. Now we come to the real question that you asked. In 1873, when the light bulb was innovated, you know, by Edison and the people in Europe, and then it was uh, refined and uh, then utilized in an AC power grid that was born by Westinghouse and Tesla in 1893 at a World's Fair, and we introduced light at night. That completely broke the paradigm for 3.8 billion years on this planet that you only have light during the daytime. You didn't have light at night. Now, I will caveat that and say humans did break the rule, um, and I would say our ancestors, the Neanderthals, 65 million years ago when they innovated light in a cave. Um, but we also put fire in a cave, and fire is a form of non-native EMF, contrary to what people want to think about today. And it's, it's absolutely not uh, congruent with what the sun produces. And the bottom line is, for the last 70,000 years, humans have been screwing with nature's laws. And nature's laws are axiomatic about, like, we, we all of our programs in us, every bit of programs in eukaryotic life for 650 million years is operational with sunlight. It's not operational with fire. It's not operational with candles. And it's certainly not operational with Tesla's power grid, Thomas Alva Edison's light bulb, or any of the iterations that have come from General Electric, Philips, or any other centralized entity that you want to mention in this podcast. And the implication of that, which is really what you asked me in your question, are vast. Why? Because the part of human biology that has gone really almost unstudied and is not well known is part of the equation that I brought up to Rick and Huberman on the podcast. I said, tell me what you know about the non-visual photoreceptor system. Tell me know what you know about OPN1, 2, three, four, five, and six. And it turns out, for those of you who did listen to that podcast, and if you haven't, hopefully after this one you will, you begin to realize that the guys who control centralized science don't know a goddamn thing about any of it. 
And that is the basis of why modern clinicians are impotent to fix Neolithic diseases because what's the big change that occurred since 1873? The light that we're forced to live under now is modern man-made light. And that light has some huge implication changes for cell and molecular biology because of the physics of cells. And this has gone almost undetected in biology up until recent times. The, the, the time that this is beginning to change was in 2016. Remember, uh, Kenford, when I brought this to the world stage in 2005, people thought I was batshit crazy. So here we are 11 years later, and the Nobel Prize is given for circadian biology. And it turns out you have to have bright days from the sun, dark nights all the time. That's really the story of that Nobel Prize. It's probably the one centralized Nobel Prize that's been given that is pure as the snow is white. And you need to know what the implications that it is. And the problem is, Modern humans for the last 130 years do not live in that world. They haven't lived in that world. We are bathed in non-native EMF. Some of the, you know, some of the people listening to this podcast are going to think this is just a story about the light we see. Actually, it turns out the story since 1995, it's about the non-native EMF we don't see that's tied to our communication. Kind of how Kenford is you know, in a foreign country, and I'm in a foreign country, but we're still able to communicate over this medium, that there's a positive connotation there because we can share information, you know, this way. But the negative connotation is that we're doing damage to ourselves. You know, and of course, Kenford can't see me on this video, but I'm in the pitch of black. It's 7.04 p.m. in El Salvador. I have red light on me, and I also have a UVA flashlight on me as well. And um, that's the kind of, I guess, detail that people need to understand. Why is Jack going to that nth degree to do it? And it, tie, it turns out that the reason for that has to do with my understanding of the non-visual photoreceptors in man. They are the things that are the key. For those of you who don't know, OP, OPN one and two, what does OPN stand for? Options. OPN one and two are the cones and rods. Everybody knows about them in your eyes. OPN three is encephalopsin. Most people who listen to this podcast won't even know what the hell encephalopsin is. And I'm going to tell you that encephalopsin, uh, which is something I haven't even talked about that much to my tribe, it's probably the single most important option as it relates to neolithic diseases. I've spent a great deal of time since 2017 telling people about OPN5, which is melanopsin, which is the blue light detector. And the reason that I've harped on the blue light detector so much is because the blue light detector is the one that we're breaking the law most. Why most of the bulbs that modern humans use both on their computer screens, uh, through their cell phones, and also through LED lights, because the governments throughout the world have, you know, now made uh, incandescent lights, you know, impossible to find, uh, and in some cases, illegal to have. Uh, it's a huge problem, a huge problem. And um, these lights are now not present for you to use, even though they did provide some marginal benefit in the early part of the 20th century. Now, we live in a world where we have transgenerational epigenetic changes, where children are being changed before they're even hatched from their mothers because of the light their grandmothers and mothers abuse uh, before the child is born. Then when the child is born into that environment, uh, the changes are hardwired into their neurologic system. That's not what we are adapted to. Uh, and it's incumbent upon the public to understand 
the story is not easy to get. I'll be the first one to tell you. It's not an easy one to get, but it's one that you critically have to make the leap to understand why your centralized physicians are impotent to fix some of the diseases that we talked about earlier. Hmm. So the main thing I extracted was opsin 5, melanopsin. That changes the game because it turns the eye into a clock, right? And that clock reads our light and dark cycles, which is what all of biology is based on, the coupled light and dark well, that, cycles. That's the circadian mechanism, but it's way more complicated than that. I mean, mm. realize that melanopsin is the number one opsin found in the human brain. Now we know, since 2017, it's also the number one opsin in our skin and our blood vessels. So that should actually stop you at hello and go, is this the reason why neurodegeneration and peripheral artery disease have such a strong link? The answer is yes. You know, when you listen to centralized experts that write New York Times bestsellers like Peter Adia, who remarks multiple times in his book, that link is present, but he has no understanding why. And yet, by training before his MD degree, he, he was an engineer. He understands thermodynamics. And why am I pointing this out to you, Kenford? Even a smart guy who has training as a, an engineer can still shit the bed. Yet, he can publish a book that people laud and say it's great when I can come on your podcast and tell you that it's not worth the toilet paper you wipe your ass with. That's the truth. And the thing is, that's a hyperbolic statement to make. But I have to tell you, Peter Addy is just like I was 20 years ago when I thought that everything I learned in my centralized training was gospel. It turns out it's not. And the thing is, to really take the next step to understand you know, the physics of organisms and truly how we work, you have to have a beginner's mindset. You have to go back to where I was when I told you when I was a young boy, walking around the Museum of Natural History on 81st and, and 7th Avenue and learning all these disparate facts and saying, how do all these pieces fit? Why, why is it that these things are true in nature Somehow we can't resolve why they're important in medicine. Like I've said in a couple of podcasts that I've done recently, and I haven't even been released uh, because somebody asked me, what's, what's the edge of my science? What's the biggest conundrum that I see out there that I think will shock people in the future that we'll find out? And this is, it's really funny because something happened since I've said this on another podcast. I said, don't you find it amazing that our sun, the number one particle that it makes is a neutrino, that happens to be the number one particle we don't know anything about, or very, I shouldn't say anything, we know very little about it. I said, do you think that biology doesn't use a neutrino in some way that we're not aware of yet? Wouldn't it make sense that the number one particle made by the sun would have an effect. And don't you think three days after I mentioned that on the podcast, somebody posted a link that scientists have now found that there's other frequencies in sunlight that they didn't expect that are now present. They found very high energy gamma waves. And people are like, wait a minute, this doesn't fit our paradigm. Here, what's in our textbooks in centralized paradigm? And see, the centralized paradigm will bury this new information because it doesn't fit the scientism or the religious dogma that we treat or teach medical students or PhD scientists. What I'm trying to tell people is you need that information uncensored to come directly from the scientists. And then we need the great thinkers to think about what's nature really doing? What's, what's the game that's being played here? What recipes is she hiding from us that may explain some of the things that we don't understand in the physiology of eukaryotes? 
Could this explain why eukaryotes are different than bacteria, why they're different than archaea? Could this explain why the physical chemistry that's present in cells are different? And you'll find, Kenford, when you look into these things deeply, into the details. Remember I told you about being a curious mammal? These are the things that fuel my passion as an old man. I can promise you, I can already see forward to my deathbed. I'm going to be pissed off that I'm dying, not because I'm dying, but because I want more time to figure this puzzle out. Hmm. Why? Because I've done the hard work of subtracting the superfluous in my education to be very open for what might be possible with Mother Nature's walk. Uh, I've heard you say in a couple of other podcasts that you don't want this information to die. And as a 22 year old man, picking it up this early, I'm going to make sure it doesn't die. Uh, that makes me I want happy. to spread I'm this. Tell you. That really makes yeah. me happy. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it actually makes me happy that I decided to do your podcast with you because I, I said this to somebody not that long ago. I think it was Mike Vera on a podcast that we just was released recently. But I feel like when we have really good thinkers out there and they die, uh, it's almost like the Library of Alexandria being burned down. And I think what people forget about in history is when the Library of Alexandria was burned down, that's actually what facilitated the Dark Ages for humanity. For, you know, wow. five to seven hundred years, we really remained in our rudimentary form, especially when it came uh, to the scientific method. And the people that really brought us forward from the Dark Ages, this is the irony to me. It wasn't the scientists. Kenford, it was the artist. It was the artist in the mm-hmm. Renaissance. And that's the reason why I have a reverence for Da Vinci, Michelangelo. And then later on, several decades, I should say, millennia later, the Renaissance painters. Because what did they do? They painted with light. They actually, from 1850 through you know, 1901, these were the guys that painted with light that were precognitive of what Einstein was going to say to the world in physics in 1905. And, you know, a lot of people think that this message somehow is hyperbolic or it's not well thought out by me, but I don't think people really understand my position and why I hold these artists in reverence. It's because Einstein never did an experiment. This was a thought experiment in his head. And if you think about artwork, what is art? Art is exactly the same thing. It's a thought experiment in the head of Henry Matisse. It's a thought experiment in the head of Rembrandt. It was a thought experiment in the mind of Monet. It was actually a thought experiment in the mind of Picasso when he started out. And Picasso was the one who decided to radically change from 1895 through 1905 never understanding anything that was going on in the world of physics. But he presupposed what was getting ready to happen in particle physics. That's where cubism comes from, where size and shape changes really matter. And you begin to see how Picasso went from his blue and rosé period to actually cubism. You see this radical change. And people don't realize that that radical change in him actually mimics what happened between the three domains of life. When we went from simple life, which was bacteria and archaea, and then all of a sudden eukaryotes came in. It's almost the same transition. I don't think people appreciate it. I think the reason they don't appreciate it, Kemper, is because I don't think they were dropped in the Museum of Natural History and the Museum of Modern Art like I was when I was five, six, seven, eight years old, and I heard what people said about these artists' work and what made them different. And then what did I do as a little kid? I started to think about when these people lived and when the science evolved, when it changed. And I realized that the artists 
presuppose the changes in physics that were coming. And that wasn't a happy accident. That actually is quantum entanglement. That's exactly what it is. And what I'm telling you is the same story was recapitulated at the Cambrian explosion. What happened between archaea and bacteria? Endosymbiosis was not a happy accident, you know, as Lynn Margolis laid it out. It actually was the next logical step that one should expect when you understand the physics of the environment and cells on the planet. And these ideas that we're sharing today, um, they're really fundamental in becoming a black swan. And, and you understanding why it is that blue light from your screen or RF and microwaves from your Apple iPhone or your iPad is horribly toxic, you know, to your family members, to you, to your mom, to your dad, how it causes hypoxia, how it steals oxygen from your mitochondria. And this leads to a different free radical signal. And that light sculpts the morphology of particles, things in your mitochondria, but also the lipoproteins, like that Peter Adia talks in his book. Like he always talks about ApoB, ApoB and large L, little p, little a. He doesn't seem to realize that sunlight actually is what sculpts those things. And it turns out that modern non-native EMF actually leads to changes in those things that lead to heart disease and decreased longevity. And if anybody listens to this, I want them to know that exercising in a blue lit gym with a bunch of idiots with earphones in their ear uh, and listening through Apple, you know, uh, what do you call those? Ear pods? Air pods? Air pods. Whatever you call them. Yeah, I mean, whatever you call them. That these things are horribly toxic, you know, for you. To me, that's the legacy. That That's the seed I want to plant in the ground. And I want you, a guy like you at 22 years old, to be, I don't want to say the conductor, but I want you to be the shepherd tending to that flock when I'm dead and say, look, guys, we were warned about this shit in the 90s, the 2000s, the 2020s. You have to keep this going because the purveyors of centralized science, the purveyors of centralized profiteering, they want to bury this fucking story. They want you to keep being obedient idiots so that they can keep harvesting you just like you know, a farmer harvests a water bottle. Hmm. One of the things that come to my mind is smoking used to be debated, but there was, you know, gradually increasing evidence and then it reached an inflection point of a critical mass where the truth was the truth. There was no debate anymore. Smoking had negative effects, but there was. Well, I would. Do, I would. I'm gonna. You're gonna be shocked when I tell you this. I'm gonna. Mm. I'm gonna disagree with you. I'm gonna tell you why. Uh -huh. um, this will probably shock a lot of people. Let's, Let's do it. Um, the science that led to the tobacco litigation for Philip Morris actually, it was convincing, but it wasn't proof positive, but it was compelling enough for them to settle the tobacco litigation. Why? It turns out that Philip Morris realized so did you, um, I forget the name of the company. I think it was not U.S. Tobacco or something. Something global tobacco company. Both of them realized that it was much more beneficial to settle this lawsuit, move on, pay the fine, and go on with it. But I'm going to tell you that science was never well delineated why cigarette smoking is really a problem. Now, I'm going to tell you the decentralized reason why cigarette smoking is really bad. Number one is obvious. It causes hypoxia. That reduces NAD positive in your mitochondria. That reduces your, um, your electron chain transport. And it raises heteroplasm rates. The second reason 
It's in tobacco. When you smoke it, especially inhalational, you're absorbing a tremendous amount of transition metals into your alveolar macrophages. And what does that do? It ruins the circadian biology in those areas, so that makes it much mm. more likely that you develop cancer. Here's the interesting part of the cancer story. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to come to New Orleans, you can fact check me on this. I have a good friend who's an artist. He used to paint outside and he smoked. And I told him, Danny, if you continue to smoke, just continue to do it outside in the sun. If you do that, you'll never get cancer. As soon as you buy a studio and you begin to paint inside, you're going to get cancer. Okay? Since Danny's got a studio, he's been sick, unending, no doubt about it. And the wisdom in my response to him, this is over 10 years ago, and I know he never put it together because he's not a scientist, he's an artist, is that he had no idea of actually how the sun works to improve melanation so that he could get rid of the transition metals, which is exactly what melanin does, so that he wouldn't get the cancer. And the thing is, when he goes inside, he loses that ability. That's the reason why cigarette smoking can be looked at really bad. When you flip that story, Kenford, uh, to the Swedish study that I always reference, it's actually referenced mm -hmm. as a pinned tweet you know, on my Twitter feed. Uh, the Swedish study shows in 2016 that lack of sunlight is as bad as cigarette smoking. That's the reason why I'm telling you the story right now. The link to both of these stories is actually melanin. And that links directly to what I said to Rick and what I said to you, Roman. And the problem is, as improbable as this story may be to you or your listeners, the links are there for you to examine. And I've expanded those links in my blogs. I, the people that remain very curious about my work, when they read my blogs, they come away stunned because I take it to the nth degree. I want you to understand why these links exist. There are no paradoxes in life. It's all quantum mechanical. There is no cause and effect. Everything is based on probabilities. And it's more probable than not that Philip Morris and U.S. tobacco definitely caused cancer in a lot of people. But if they would have told people to smoke their products outside, I got news for you. The amount of uh, carcinoma of the lung probably would have been significantly reduced. They probably would still would have got emphysema, but I think carcinoma would have been reduced. Uh, what I'm telling people right now is the more technology you use, the more Neolithic diseases you will get. And the type of Neolithic diseases you get is functionally tied how you use the technology. And this story is actually recapitulated in Steve Jobs' story. He's, I, I tell Bitcoiners this all the time. He's the biggest epic fail in anybody in technology. Why? Because he amassed billions of dollars of wealth, but his health failed him at 56 years old because of the technology he built. And don't think that he was a dumbass. He actually knew exactly what he was doing because he wouldn't even let his kids use his own technology. And I always famously tell people, if you parse the words in his autobiography, he tells you the truth in there if you listen. In the iPad 2, he put an infrared sensor device in there. Why? Because he knew that when the iPad touched a children's leg, it would turn off the RF and microwave. You would think such an innovative device would have been something that Steve Jobs, the ultimate marketer, would have talked to the world about it. But why didn't he talk about it? Because if he did, you would have began to question, why is this such an innovation? Why? Is there a downside? Is there a negative connotation to using his device to communicate? And the issue for a guy like you and a guy like me is I need to pass that information to you. I don't know, mm -hmm. Kenford, when you read Steve Jobs' book, did you pick up that little nuance? Because guess what? That was the nuance between the words. Okay? It was there. He's telling you the truth. But guess what? You had to decipher the code. 
And it should be no shock that he died from a retroperitoneal cancer. Why? Because he's the person in the world that coined the term laptop. That means he put the RF and microwave device that emitted blue light through the screen in his lap. Okay? And then what else did he do famously in every Apple talk that he ever did? His Levi jeans always had the outline of his iPod or his iPhone in his back pocket. And he died of a retroperitoneal cancer that metastasized to his liver. But guess what? Anybody who's a biophysicist will tell you that the target zone of that radiation was his retroperitoneal space. Okay? And like when I, when I do gamma knife surgeries for brain tumors, we actually have physicists that target the tumors. These guys are experts in knowing how to target the tumors. And guess what? When I show them Steve Jobs' chapter in his book, and I have this discussion like I'm having with you, all of them look at me like, even I didn't see this. It's blatantly obvious. It's right there. So my goal for a guy like you at 22 years old, I never want you to do another podcast with me with earphones in your ears. I want to make sure they're air tubes. I can tell you, I'm sitting in El Salvador right now with you, but my nurse and one of my members sitting in front of me in, in red light. I got no earphones on. I got the Pacific Ocean on my ear. Uh, I don't care if the video quality is bad. Uh, I don't care about any of that. Why? Because the quality information I give you is high fidelity. This is as good as good gets in 2023. I don't know if you're going to be able to get this from anybody else. But I want to make sure you're recording it and you get it loud and clear. Technology has a negative connotation. And it's about time everybody start to look at it. Everybody seems to get the message that messenger RNA vaccines, which were also a technology, had a negative connotation. It's time that you realize your phone, your computer, your iPad, your fucking Garmin device, those stupid AirPods that you put in your ear to listen to podcasts like this, they're killing you. They are a problem. In fact, the light bulbs that your mother has on in your sister's room, uh, the, the Fitbit devices, the Apple iWatch. I have a, a member's daughter right to my right right now, 15 feet from me, who's argued with me for 10 days why she has this little lesion below her iPhone watch and on the back of her wrist. And magically, she has not been wearing it. She's putting her wrist up right now. And it's been getting better in the strong sun here. But make no mistakes, Kenton. If she goes back and wears that watch, it will come back. I promise you it will come back. The same effect is true for people who smoke and have these transition metals in their lungs. When they use this device, they're more toxic. People who vape, who use these devices, it'll be more toxic. People that have tattoos over their body and use these devices, they will be more toxic. I don't fucking care what they think. It's the truth. And guess what? My mouth is not a bakery. My, my mouth is here to do a podcast with you to tell you that there's negative connotations to all these things. It's your job as the CEO of you to make a determination. Is Jack Cruz a wackadoodle, crazy neurosurgeon, or might he be wiser than any centralized doctor you ever heard because he understands the connection quantum mechanically between how atoms work and electromagnetic fields? That's, that's the determination, Kenford, of your listeners. I'm making the assumption that you thought it was wise to talk to me because you thought maybe some of the ideas that I have would be beneficial to your audience. A hundred percent. The people around me are completely oblivious to the 
effects of non-native EMF and it passes by them every single day that I'm around them. So let's bridge that gap, right? How does the non-native EMF provide a detrimental mechanism, a harmful mechanism to the body? Because if people hear that your technology is bad for you, they're just going to wave it off because they're attached to it. They're addicted to it. But let's give them a smoking gun. Not line. attached. Let's, let's say the right word. They are addicted to it. Addicted to it. And they're addicted to it because guess what? Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Paul Allen, uh, the people at Google, both founders knew that it lowers your dopamine level. And every time you use technology, you get a dopamine hit. But you have to realize the question you're asking me right now is a spectacular one. But each part of the electromagnetic spectrum that technology uses has a different example. Let's talk about the most common one that I talk about on podcasts, blue light. Most screens emit blue light. They have two different types of blue light hazard. One is Noel, uh, the other one is like a fusel. Uh, the key that you need to know is the ROS that causes it in the blue light distribution is 435 to about 470. Uh, and that's nanometer light. That's formally or, or, or really firmly in the blue light range. Um, that's what melanopsin is attuned to. Uh, and that's one of the reasons it's a huge problem. What ultimately happens when Blue light is present to the nth degree in that range. That option, OPN5, has vitamin A bound to it. Vitamin A gets liberated, and the vitamin A that's liberated destroys all photoreceptors that are non-visual and visual. That means OP1 all the way to OP6. That means rods, the cones, cephalopsin, neuropsin, uh, melanopsin, and, and rhodopsin. And it also destroys all heme-based photoreceptors. What are some of those? That's the P450 system. That's the cytochromes in your mitochondria. That's catalase in your red blood cells. That's B12 in your body. Um, this is the reason why people who are non-native EMF get anemia. and They don't realize it. It's become from a lack of sunlight and too much technology. Uh, does it also destroy the biggies? which are melatonin and DHA that are critical in restoring regeneration. Now remember, what we just said here, Kenford, is just the blue light story. Let's talk about RF. RF is a completely different mechanism. What does RF do? RF tends to change the precession of protons in our body. So let's get to that story. What does Jack Cruz do every day when he's in his clinic to destroy the procession of protons in his patient's body? I order an MRI scan. MRI scan has a T1 and T2 relaxing phase. We pulse RF radiation through um, an MRI, and that changes the procession, and we measure when it bounces back, and that distance between the pulse of RF and the measure bouncing back gives us something called a relaxation phase. And that reflection of that response in your tissues creates an image that we call an MRI. And that's what we look for in a T1 and T2 image. Now, there's other things that we can do to, how shall we say, manipulate that signal to get more information from it. But that's the basis of it. What you need to know is that when you listen to FM or AM radio, which is exactly what Marconi did when he stole most of Tesla and Addison's work before he won his Nobel Prize, radio was the first thing that used and changed perception. Uh, for people, so they're clear on this, are there natural changes uh, that affect perception of protons on Earth, true, uh, when it rains and there's electrical storms, perceptions of electrons, I should say, perception of protons are changed. When it snows, the same thing happens. Those things 
are natural, decentralized things that your body is optimized for paying attention to. But when you get um, an unnatural perception, say when you have a circumpolar flight, you get more RF radiation in it. Or say you happen to live in Southern California where there's a ton of UHF and VHF radiation, which is loaded with RF radiation, the perception of your protons is off. When the perception of your protons are off, can they function in your rhea and TCA cycle normally? The answer is no, they cannot. Okay, so now we just covered two parts of the problem. Let's cover the third part. The third part is the microwave part. So most people, I think by this time in 2023, know that microwaves are emitted from pretty much every tech device that is used to communicate over long distances. For example, you and I tonight are using, I don't know, something you asked me to use, some kind of app with Iris FM. I guarantee I'm being fucking radiated through the max by using this, but I'm doing things to offset it. And I'm sure you are as well. We both are protecting ourselves from the blue light, but we're really not protecting ourselves from the RF on the microwave. And I know that. You may not. But what do microwaves do? Well, let's go to things that people understand about microwaves. When you have leftover steak, you put it in the microwave, you learn very uh, acute in life that if you put the microwave or the meat in the microwave and don't wrap it in paper towel that's wet, that the meat turns out to taste very leathery and dehydrated. Why? Because that's what microwaves do. They, they oscillate protons in matter to the nth degree. And what does that do? It dehydrates and evaporates water around it. So let's scale this to something that we all have experienced. When we fly from, say, the UK to New York City, we have a circumpolar flight. You have 250 idiots in the plane, all using Wi-Fi. You are the piece of steak in the plane while they're all doing that. And all their Wi-Fi is bouncing off the inside of the plane. And you don't have a paper towel wrapped around you. So do you think that your mitochondria can create as much water as it normally would? The answer is it can't. Okay? But see, everybody seems to know that when they have leftover steak from a night of going and getting hammered and getting drunk, that you got to wrap it, you know, in a paper towel that's loaded with water because then the steak isn't dehydrated. Then you should begin to ask yourself the question, <clears throat> what is it about water that allows you to offset this whole microwave situation? That opens up a huge can of worms for the black swan mitochondria because then you begin to realize, hey, wait a minute. Jack has told us that mitochondria normally make water. Uh, Non-native EMF of all types outside the visible spectrum dehydrate us. So anytime we're dehydrated, what does that mean? We're hypoxic, meaning we have low oxygen tension. What else does it mean? means NAD positive drops in the cell. It means that you cannot use the TCA cycle and you become less efficient at using the urea cycle that's important for protein. So I want you to think about all these meatheads that are using a carnivore diet when I give this discussion. If you're working out in a blue light gym, you think eating that big old fucking steak that you post on Instagram every day is a big uh, panacea for your problem? It's not. Because you can't use the nutrients in that state properly because your TCA and urea cycle don't work. And it's due to the choices that you made of your lighting environment. That gets back, Kenford, to the August 8th Twitter. Eight, eight tweets to teach you about the details of why Uncle Jack's right about this. See, many of the meatheads that listen to this, listen to this podcast, they're gonna, they're, they're not gonna like this. It's not, this won't be popular, but it's as fucking true as any confession you're gonna hear from some kind of criminal on their deathbed. And the bottom line is, I don't give a shit 
what you think about me, and I don't give a shit about what you think about the message. But what I'm telling you is 100% decentralized truth. And when you realize it, you'll begin to understand why I always say that diet and exercise can't fix a quantum problem. And therein lies a big statement. So I just gave you three examples, three different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that will hinder you. Now, I promise you, there's a lot more, and there's a lot more science that I didn't go into. But I don't think it's important to split your listeners or your readers' heads wide open. I just want you to know there is one octave of the electromagnetic spectrum that you're optimized to. It turns out that's the visible spectrum. That goes between 250, 760, and what do you do in that spectrum? Your cells, they're designed to make CO2 and water and a lot of melatonin. If you live in that spectrum more than any other, you will never need to have Uncle Jack's wisdom or advice. Because effectively, you will be the hippo or lion that lives in nature. See, I don't have to teach hippos and lions the stuff that I'm teaching you in this podcast. But I have to teach humans this because they have frontal lobes that allow them to break nature's laws. Therein lies the difference. And those frontal lobes think, hey, I exercise, I eat a good diet, this non-native EMF stuff, I can just equalize it. And what you laid out is the physics of organisms set the context through which chemistry, such as diet, exercise, operates in, right? So that's why we can't just rely on the chemical stuff, the quantum well, mechanics. Biochemistry, stuff. biochemistry, biology, uh, I'm even going to tell you, regular chemistry, even organic chemistry, is really a physics when you get around that right down to it. Mm-hmm. Physics is the only foundational science. But, you know, when you say that to a bunch of, Biochemists, you say it to a bunch of biologists, you say it to a bunch of chemists, they get offended. Why? Because that's what they're experts in. But they don't realize that fundamentally, when you get down to it, it's all physics at the core. And it turns out the physics of organisms is quantum mechanical, it's not parsimonious, it doesn't follow Occam's razor. There is nothing parsimonious about e equals mc squared. And there's certainly nothing parsimonious about the photoelectric effect. And there's nothing parsimonious about general and special relativity. But guess what? As Feynman said, nature is queer, nature is absurd, and it's time most of you fucking idiots out there understand it. I, at work, on my lunch breaks, tend to sunbathe, you know, get get that Palm C regulation up, the UVA light, UVB light. And I've been approached so many times like, hey, man, you're going to get skin cancer. They're they're like genuinely concerned for me. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. I try to lay it out, parse it out. And they kind of, you know, I'm met with eye rolls. Ah, he doesn't know. He should get that sunscreen, whatever. All the the bullshit. Could you like decimate that (laughs) notion? Well... I mean, it's actually, um, let's go back to like plants and trees. Why mm-hmm. is it that they're 100% connected to the earth? Their canopies are 100% connected to the sun, but they never get cancer. Well, uh, I'll cut to the chase. The reason is they make a, a chemical in them called auxin, and auxin protects them. What is auxin for a plant in us? It's called melanin, mm-hmm. okay? And if you make enough melanin, there's no chance you're ever going to get cancer. And the proof in the pudding is found in every dermatology paper ever printed in PubMed. What does it say? It says people who get basal cell, um, squamous cell, and melanoma always have low vitamin D levels. Well, if the dermatologists and ophthalmologists are correct, that bad cancers are formed from sunlight, that everybody who gets those cancers should have vitamin D levels through the roof. But what does it turn out? It turns out that it's exactly the opposite. It's the people who stay inside under blue light that gets the cancers. And they tend to get the cancers in places that are not solar exposed. Well, that makes you ask the question, 
How is this possible? Explain to me, centralized dermatologist and ophthalmologist, and you know what the answer is? Bidee, 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 that's all, folks. It's like a cartoon. You know why? They don't have an answer. And the reason they don't have an answer is because they have no earthly idea about the quantum mechanical principles of how cells truly work. But they've been sold the idea from L'Oreal, from Chanel, uh, through people who want to sell tyrosinase blockers, like sunscreen. Um, why this is a good idea? Because it turns out if you block the sun, like Bill Gates wants to do, you get more centralized Neolithic diseases so that you can be wallet boxed by centralized medicine. That's good business for the profiteers of medicine. And it turns out, ophthalmologists and dermatologists are the gatekeepers for centralized medicine. This is the reason why, in the United States, they lock up opiates in the pharmacies, but they always make sure that the sun cream and the skin cancer-causing chemicals that are in them are always never locked up. So that way they steal them and sell them to people for a dollar or two because then they can sell them more of the opiates, more of the diabetes medicine, more of the hypertension medicines that those companies make trillions of dollars on. That's how the game is, is played. And until people understand how centralized and decentralized medicine really works, they're never going to get to the point that they're even going to understand this podcast. And the, the, the issue is right now, I think 20% of the people that will listen to your podcast will get this decentralized medicine. And they'll get it because of what they just faced with COVID. Um, it turns out the government and centralized experts, Kenford, told everybody in the world to stay inside, stay out of the sun, right? Don't mm -hmm. talk to other people. Okay. Eat shitty uh, fake food grown in uh, laboratories. Don't worry about going to visit your relatives in, in, in the hospital or going to farmer's markets. Do not go to the beach. Uh, if you live in Canada or Australia, we'll actually strangle you to hypoxia on videos. We'll make babies just born wear masks. You understand the whole process here? Every single thing the centralized paradigm told us to do was fucking dead wrong. And you know why it was wrong? Because they were funneling you to rolling up your sleeve to take the jab. Now here we are three years later. How has that worked out for, let's say, DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills? How that work out for LeBron James' son? How that work out for J.J. Watt of the, the Arizona Cardinals in Houston, Texas? How that work out for about 250 soccer players in Europe? How that work out for people who collapsed on screen on TV who were forced to take the jab? See, let me just tell you something. When you don't question the centralized experts and you comply with their wants, needs, and desires, you reap what you sow. What you get is what you get. And the bottom line is you are the CEO of your health. Do not let anyone tell you without informed consent what you should do. Informed consent is between you and your doctor, not between you and your employer, not between you and your government. I'm not a religious person, but one of Jesus' quotes that stood out to me is, a good tree can't bear bad fruit. And what I see in centralized medicine is chronic disease. A lot of bad fruit. Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree with it's, you. It's, it's a obvious, great quote. Right? Obvious, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, well, I think it is. But Kenford, it's not. It doesn't matter if it's obvious to me or you. You know who it has to be obvious to? The people you're going to release this podcast to. Because guess what? If they remain compliant and they're obedient idiots, here's the flip side that you're probably not going to like what I'm going to say. Those people deserve what they get. I, I, I really don't feel bad about the people that have gotten the problems they've gotten. Why? 
because they said, well, I didn't know. Well, well, how the hell did I know not to do the things that the government was asking us to do? How did I lead my tribe not to do those things? How did you not get that message? You know why? Because you were compliant. You signed up for the government story. You signed up for centralized medicine story. Will you make the mistake the next time? Will you sign up for the climate scam hoax? Will you sign up for the hoax that's going on with uh, money? Will you never buy Bitcoin? Will you make other mistakes? You absolutely will. Why? Because you haven't improved the most important thing about you, which is the ability to critically think properly. That's the key. It's no longer about survival of the fittest. It's about survival of the wisest. And remember, you're the mammal on this planet that's got a lot of lobes in your brain. You're supposed to be able to think better than most. 80% of the people listening to this podcast, you have failed that test. I want to get back to something you said in the beginning where you cannot let consensus drive your truth. That's been a theme in my life. I've always felt crazy because I've always taken the contrary, the contrary position. People would look at me strange for even questioning COVID, like the thought of it, you know. Uh, could you parse out for the listeners, you know, moving forward to wrap this up? Why you can't just look to the, the masses, the big groups, the 99%. You must pave your own way and really discern for yourself what the truth is. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you where, the, where we went off the beaten path. I'm going to tell you that um, evolution has actually created in us. We are designed to follow the leader, okay? Following the leader worked when the leader was fully decentralized. So when you had a smart American Indian or you had a smart wildebeest, or you had a smart buffalo or smart elephant, uh, they generally led their tribe to help. Where did we go off the rails? Around 1911, when we allowed a guy named John D. Rockefeller obscure what was true in biology through something called the Flexner Report. And he collaborated with some of the other people um, of his time, specifically J.P. Morgan. And these two things happened at the same time as the United States gave control over their monetary system to the central bank. So in 1911, everything changed. And it turns out that the United States has been the dominant thought leader in Western both politics, economics, and medicine. And what people don't know outside the United States, and I would even tell you, I almost hesitate to give Americans credit. The guy that understood this better than anybody else is a guy named Benjamin Rush. He was a founding father of the United States before the Constitution and Declaration of Independence was written. And he petitioned Thomas Jefferson to put medical tyranny into our Constitution. And he was rejected by Jefferson because Jefferson could not fathom a time would people that be that stupid to allow the government to make decisions over their health care. But it turned out it only took 250 years to prove Benjamin Rush a prophet or precedent. Uh, and he was correct. Uh, COVID was that test case that proved Rush right. We have a medical school right now in Chicago called Rush Medical School. Most people in the United States don't even know who Benjamin Rush was. I know most people in Europe have absolutely no clue who he is, but he was a decentralized patriot who actually signed our founding documents. Why do I tell you this story? Because it turns out in 1911, which is roughly 150 years after the founding documents, John D. Rockefeller was taken out by Teddy Roosevelt uh, with Standard Oil. We eliminated him as an oil and kerosene monopoly. John D. Rockefeller told Congress at that time in testimony that's still in the archives that you can go read. 
that he would take it out of the hides of Congress and see to it that he would bankrupt the United States over the decision to break up Standard Oil. Most people to this very day, outside the United States and even inside, do not know that John D. Rockefeller formed Big Pharma as it exists today. The people that raped and pillaged you through the messenger RNA vaccines, they have an ancestry that goes back to 1911 and the breakup of Standard Oil. And you need to realize that the people that are against you and decentralization, these are the people that are anti-Benjamin Rush. They now exist in the government of the United States. They exist in the government of the UK. They exist in Canada. They exist in Australia. They exist in the World Health Organization. They exist um, in the IMF. They exist in every single place where unelected people are. The King of England is the biggest offender of this. But remember, he is not the ruler. He's a figurehead. But he's highly influential. Okay? And you need to understand, these people are a cancer to decentralized processes. What do I teach people? Mitochondrial medicine is fully decentralized. Why? Because it's based on the laws of nature. Once you understand that process, you'll begin to understand why you need to decentralize every single thing in your life, whether it's your ideology, your politics, your finances, and your medicine. You do that effectively, you're the CEO of you, and you're a, you are part of my tribe. Why? I follow Mother Nature. Mother Nature dictates what I tell my tribe. Nothing, in my opinion, it's my opinion alone. If I haven't learned it from Mother Nature, I do not espouse it on a podcast. I do not write a blog post about it. I do not sell you any supplements or any drugs or any surgeries. I am teaching you advice. I'm teaching you the wisdom of nature, the physics of organisms. I want you to understand this library of Alexandria that's buried right in front of your own eyes that you keep ignoring because people like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Paul Allen, the leaders of Pfizer, Moderna, are blinding you to with their centralized bullshit. What I love about this is you are a neurosurgeon. You know, people would think it's just science, but you bring in everything, history, art, medicine, politics, etc. And what I want to emphasize to the listener is all these things connect. What you got to do as the CEO of yourself is connect the dots, really see how everything fits together, take the whole picture in and use that in your own decision making processes, such as decentralizing every area of your life. Right? Totally agree. Get to it. Turn the podcast awesome. off. Buy some Bitcoin. Hire decentralized doctors. Get in the sun. See the sunrise every day. Ground at the, the ocean's edge. Become like the Sphinx. Eat like a great white shark. Live like a polar bear. Kick ass. Take names. And the only thing I ask of you is tell one of your neighbors who's in the dark, who's sick, who's got type 1 diabetes and doesn't realize that it's related to the latitude. Somebody who's 360 pounds who doesn't understand what leptin resistance is and doesn't understand what melanin is, share with them. Let's, let's sit them down and listen to this podcast. Something yeah. in this podcast resonates with one person that it was worth for me to stay up for an hour and a half later in El Salvador while it's pitch black to have this discussion with Kenford. Amazing. That's what the podcast is called, the Lighthouse Podcast, to light those who are in the dark. So, Dr. Cruz, I thank you very much. I'm very grateful for you coming on. And I'm sure we lit even one person with this discussion. So, with that being said, thank you guys for listening to this episode of the podcast. And 
stay tuned for the next one. Cheers. Take care, Kenford. Just send me Take the care, link. Take care, Dr. Cruz. All, all right? Yes, sir. Take care. I will. Thank you.